Are you ready? Live from the Metal Mayhem Studios in Rochester, New York. We are gold. We are gold. And heard around the world by metalheads just like you. This is Metal Mayhem ROC. Heavy metal music. Your weekly dose of metal music. Interviews, album reviews, news, and more. Want to be part of the show? Send us a message through our website, MetalMayhemROC.com. Or hit us up on Facebook and Twitter. Search Metal Mayhem ROC. It's getting nice and heavy. Now, welcome our hosts, John the Vernomatic Verno and Metal Forever March. Besides getting heavy, looks like it's going to get snowy, cold, and windy. In the rock. Metal Mayhem ROC. I'm John the Vernomatic Verno, and tonight we have a debate show. No interviews, no music, just Metal Forever Mark and myself tackling a couple show segments. Fire and Ice and the Great Metal Debate. Two topics where both Mark and I will pick a side and we'll debate, we'll discuss, and we'll try to convince each other that our thoughts and our ways is the right way. I want to thank you for joining us any way that you did. MetalMayhemROC.com is the best way to reach us. Go to the website. You can go to our Spreaker channel. Find us on iTunes. Find us on iHeartRadio. And if you have to, you can even find us on Spotify. Every Thursday night, 8 p.m., new show segments drop. And we're lining up some new interviews for later in the fall and early winter. So just stay tuned to the Metal Mayhem ROC Facebook page for more details. That being said, we're going to have a message from our show sponsor, Mr. V's Street Style Vending, and then we're going to get right to it. Again, thanks for joining. I'm the Vernomatic. Metal Forever Mark will be back after this, and we'll get into Fire and Ice. This edition of Metal Mayhem ROC is brought to you by Mr. V's Street Style Vending and Special Events Catering. Visit our lunch cart in the College Town District at Strong Memorial Hospital or hit up the late night weekend location at the corner of Monroe Avenue in South Goodman. Look us up at MRVSVending.com for catering, pricing, and availability. That's Mr. V's Street Style Vending and Special Events Catering. Now, back to Metal Mayhem ROC. Today we're tackling fire and ice, which is, I guess, our way of saying either or. <laughs> which one do you like? Which one do you not? So, uh, or which one do you choose over the other? So today we're going to tackle two, I guess you call them um, melodic. Some people call it hair metal, although I hate that term. Guitar players from back in the day and even still present moment, they're still out there shredding away. Uh, Warren D. Martini from Rat or Fire, Ice. Um, George Lynch from Dokken and Lynch Mob and a whole bunch of other projects. So, Vertimatic, who are you going with? Fire Ice, D. Martini, or George Lynch? Okay, well, both guys uh, <laughs> have a history, and I've seen both of them many times. Out of the two, I like Warren D. Martini better. I think that the, what he did with some of that rat stuff out of the cellar, the EP, um, invasion of your privacy. One of the I would put any George Lynch riff against Lay It Down. Warren D. Martini, he's the heart and soul of that band when Robin Crosby was still in there. That was a a duel that, hey, there's the, the hits that they have. Wanted Man, uh, Back for More, um, well, Round and Round. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on. The cover of uh, Walking the Dog from the EP. I just really loved Warren D. Martini's tone. That being said, George Lynch has a history of him, too, and... I'm in the process of listening to the Brian Schlegel audio book, and he's talking about uh, George Lynch. Back in the day, he was in a band called Exciter, not the Canadian Exciter, but a E-C-I-T-E-R or E-X-C-I-T-E-R Exciter, and it played the Sunset Strip in California, in Los Angeles, in the pre-pre 
hair metal days. And so George Lynch has a little bit of a longer history. Going head to head, I, my take is Warren D. Martini. Wow, Vernon Mack, you uh, make some great arguments. And um, I, I, and you know, this goes back to that hair metal thing. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, yeah, rat, round and round. I'm like, when people bring that up, it really uh, it bothers me because I think Rat has so many great songs. Uh, the guitar riffs that Warren D. Martini has are incredible. Like, if you are a guitar player um, or try to be a guitar player, like I have done in overtime, I just know I can't play it. Like, I just... I can't play it. I give it up. I mean, I could probably learn a little bit of the intro to lay it down, but beyond that, I, I don't get too far. But but all that stated, I'm going to go with George Lynch, and only because I think George Lynch in some ways created almost his own style of uh, heavy metal guitar playing that um, a lot of other people have tried to emulate along the way but never kind of got it right. Um to this day, I think um, I'm going to go, I think Back for the Attack is one of the greatest kind of albums, like front to back, that I guess was ever written in that sense. And I know that just the riffs and the playing, guitar playing in there is incredible. Of course, the classic Mr. Scary's in that one. created his own style and it kind of really put you know stamp on that band i really wish those guys all would have kind of figured things out because right when they kind of started breaking up they were going to go on their headlining tour and they really started gaining popularity so um now you know some of the lynch mob stuff i'm not as big on uh but you can't argue with george lynch's guitar playing either so for those reasons i'm going with lynch but it's a definitely almost like a photo finish as the saying would go <laughs> so just got word that George Lynch, they're redoing the... Oh, uh, Wicked Sensations. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. redoing it, re, well, re, re-recording it. Well, they're doing that, but they were also going to go on the road with Dokken, and they were going to support Dokken, where George was going to play a couple of songs with Dokken, and they were going to do that whole album front to back, is what they were planning on doing. And here's another crazy fact, guitarist to guitarist. I don't know if you know this, Vernomatic, but I was a little surprised. Richie Faulkner... Just had a baby with George Lynch's daughter. And I saw a little article snippet that George Lynch said that if Andy Sneap doesn't continue on with Priest, he would step in for Priest. Did you know that? No, I didn't. (laughs) Richie Faulkner. Now, I don't know if he's married to George Lynch's daughter or not. Maybe they are, but they just had a child together. And there's pictures of those guys posing, posing with the baby. So George Lynch is a grandpa, thanks to Richie Faulkner, and George said he would go on road with Priest if Andy Sneap dropped out. Well, maybe, that's crazy. Maybe um, <laughs> Richie should give his uh, mommy's uh, baby mommy's dad a job. <laughs> wow, that's good shit. Richie Faulkner, uh, great. I love Richie Faulkner. Yeah. Well, here we can do another fire and ice. Richie Faulkner or KK Downing? Okay, I don't think uh, that's KK Downing. Okay. Sure about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, didn't Richie just step in and save the band that probably was going to be done if um, kind of once KK left and Glenn started having his health problems and Richie put all new energy and, like, firepower? It could be, you could argue there, that's right into the top five of all Priest releases of all time. So I, I agree with firepower being top five Priest because it's just fantastic. Right, and that's all Richie. But that is They could say Richie. Glenn contributed, but uh, we all know. Yeah, I know. Um, but the thing with, um, and I have, to, you have to, I'll send you the KK Downing audible book. If Judas, and this is a discussion, a whole nother discussion. If Judas Priest would have utilized KK Downing a little more rather than the internal, according to KK's book, KK would have stayed there. Richie Faulkner is an excellent talent. I endorse him a thousand percent. I would, I just wish KK could have came back. And taking Glenn's spot. Or actually, Richie moves over to Glenn, right. <laughs> Glenn's they, spot. So Richie doesn't copy KK anymore. <laughs> it is amazing, though, uh, just how they look. You know, Richie definitely looks a lot like KK when it comes to, like, stage presence and kind of, you know, counterbalancing where Glenn was. And 
Andy Sneap, I guess. But but yeah, um, yeah. So but I hear what you're saying. So you, you know, hats you know, get everybody respect KK and what he. Why would you that. actually say that uh, Faulkner is above KK Downing? Everything that KK there's has a chance, done for that There band. is a chance that Richie is a better guitar player than KK and potentially a better songwriter. I don't know about soloists. I think solos, KK probably does better. Um, and even if you read KK's book like I have, KK just self-learned the guitar all, all by himself, and the fact that he became as good as he did is pretty remarkable in and of itself. But, uh, you know, I you know it's possible Richie's a better actually just straight up like if you talk technical guitar player who's maybe better and and I think Richie can write great song I mean he writes great riffs so uh, but I do think KK solos could be better but yeah it's possible Richie's better just straight up guitar player to guitar player well yeah I I get where you're saying with that but then that's the, you can make an argument you know uh, basketball players today are better than basketball players thirty years ago it's just <laughs> they've gotten better and. It's better equipment, or they started earlier. And like you just said, KK started, you know, self-taught. And, you know, KK didn't come from the best background. You know, he was he was raised by, his, like, his aunt or something. He had a terrible home life in industry when he was, like, 12. You know, KK Downing um, was a Jimi Hendrix groupie. He used to go. Oh see, yeah, yeah, I saw to, that. Yeah. They, they like he followed him on the road and like yeah. slept in parks and park benches and stuff. And um, so, by the way, I know we're getting way off topic, but we just went from Warren D. Martini to George Lynch, Fire and Ice versus Fire and Ice Richie Faulkner KK because Richie's connection to George Lynch. And I'm just going to go one more, just throw it in for good measure. Dave Murray or Adrian Smith, and we're going to leave Yannick Years on the shelf for the moment. Fire or Ice, which one are you going with? Dave Murray or Adrian Smith? <laughs> well, yeah. um, it's your favorite, you know, Mont Rushmore yeah. bands, Iron um, Maiden. So it's like, you know, picking over your kids. It's it, you love them both. The Dave Murray is fantastic. Dave Murray, what one original? And I, 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 it's it's even. I can't pick a better. I can't pick better one. I'm going to go with Adrian Smith all day long. And the only reason, two reasons. One, I just think he's more old school metal. And Dave Murray's always like popping around, smiling. And, you know, not as bad as Yannick Gears is jumping around and spinning around the stage. But I also think Adrian Smith helped with some of Bruce's solo stuff. Well, yeah. Which I think is some of the best solo stuff Bruce ever did. So if you're going to say who's like more like metal, like from Iron Maiden, I'm going with Adrian Smith. And he's been a main, well, they've both been mainstays in the band, I suppose. But anyway, and it's hard for me to know who's a better solo, like who can do better solos, because they, that band trades solos like all the way left and right. It's hard to know, you know, who's doing what sometimes. Well, you know, you got to remember Dave Murray. You know, he, he wrote with Steve Harris the first Iron Maiden album. He was there from the beginning. So if you're talking metal, who wrote Transylvania? So when did Adrian Smith come in? Or we have to fact check. A, no, Adrian Smith came in on Killers. Oh, he, re, he, okay. re, he, re, he replaced um, Samson. Um, so Dave Murray, Dave Murray's like original Trans- Transylvania, right? Yeah. The, so, the very mm. first Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden, Sanctuary, wow. Transylvania, Running Free, <laughs> do, 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 yeah. do, you know, so Adri- argue. Adrian Smith came in on Killers and Adrian Smith's fantastic. One of my favorite Iron Maiden songs of all time, uh, Wasted Years. Adrian Smith wrote that. Adrian Smith also wrote Stranger in a Strange Land. So he, you know, he wanted to spread his wings, and you're right. What he did with uh, Bruce on uh, Tyranny of Souls, um, uh, Tattooed Millionaire, the, the, that solo. And I don't know why you give balls to Picasso such a hard time. <laughs> I don't yeah. like it. And Skunk Works is another one. I just, <laughs> well, yeah, no, not he, for me. So I can't and, listen to it. I and, tried. And then when Adrian came back, the work, some of the work he did on Brave New World, oh, fantastic. Dance, Dance of Death. You know, and so. Well, sometimes you need some fire, like when it's cold out, and sometimes you need some ice, like it's been 100 degrees last couple of weeks. So, yeah, so. You know, uh, anyway. Any, anything, <laughs> uh, any other closing thoughts on any of this? I just think it's funny how we went from uh, Doc and Rat to Priest to Maiden, all in one little segment. So that's that's pretty cool. And, uh, <laughs> when, you know, when Metal you Metal Mayhem ROC. <laughs> when you hear this, uh, visit the... Metal Mayhem ROC Facebook group page, and let me uh, let us hear your your input. 
because um, we'd like to maybe you can right, uh, so dispute some of the Mark's claims. While here. while we're still on this, this, I'm going to throw one more at you, and then we'll call this one a wrap. So back to George Lynch, he wrote the instrumental "Mr. Scary," and that's a pure instrumental. And then meanwhile, Metallica on Master of Puppets wrote the instrumental Orion heavy bass riff with some uh, new, not, I'm um, sorry, um, Kirk Hammett guitar work, fire or ice. What are you doing? Instrumental metal instrumental, Mr. Scary against Orion. Orion. No explanation. No, <laughs> is that Kirk Hammett's finest or is that because of the bass riff or because of the, just the whole deal? Like, well, you know, <laughs> Oh, He's going to the tapes or something, or I don't know. I'm going to go with Mr. Scary. I still think it's one of the greatest metal instrumentals of all time. All right, Vernomatic's pulling out some show props. I'm not sure what that is. But, well, um, um, or you don't even think they should be in the same discussion, no. those two you know, I, I'm not even going to dig it out, but the bottom line, there's a whole story, and I'll, I will get down to this. The whole thing with Orion, it's, it's not even about Kirk Hammett. That was, that was um, Cliff Burton's song. He wrote the guitar part. And that middle, that middle uh, passage, that do 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 do. Oh do, right, do, the, when, do, it, when do, it goes do, down do, tempo. Do, and, wow. right. Yeah, I yeah. mean, the, the, to this day, it's still. It, it, I think honestly, Mark, I think um, it, it should be Mister Scary against uh, maybe some some other kind of instrumental kind of song because Orion nothing again and Mr. Scary that's a fantastic that, that that's fantastic that's from back to attack that is probably uh Dawkins best work that's when they finally matured yeah. that's when they were on tour with the Monsters of Rock so there's nothing against that it's just unfair to compare it against something where it's one of Metallica's and Cliff Burton's pinnacle pieces so, yeah, and you know that that whole metal instrumental might actually be another Mount Rushmore for another day in the sense that there's not a lot of instrumentals on metal albums in many ways, but then I think if you really dig into it, there are there are instrumental like for example, Arch Enemy has a bunch of instrumentals almost on a, a lot of their earlier albums. Um my buddy um or my boy Metal Mike from Halford, you know, he uh, more or less put out almost a whole album of instrumentals Nita Strauss did, so I'm sure if we go digging into the vaults, we could find some more instrumentals, but uh, they're not all that common but or prevalent but in metal, but uh, there's definitely some good ones out there. So you're going to say Orion doesn't even belong in the same conversation as um, Mr. Scary. I guess that's your take. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> we'll talk off air, but I have a uh, new fire and ice for the future. So Okay, we'll leave it at that. Mark, I'm going to let you lead this one. What's your take? What killed metal in the 90s? Yep, and this is a great metal debate because uh, I see a lot of chatter, and I've been seeing a lot of people in this coronavirus world, quarantine world that we live in, posting like, you know, if you could only pick one album from the 90s or pick one album from the 85, and they'll put like 20 albums up or rank your top three, and they show all these album covers. And a lot of times in the 80s, like it's really, really hard, right? And then you start getting into 90, 91, 92, 93. And then, you know, that's where I think bands kind of started going off the rails a little bit. Like, for example, I saw one in the 90s, like, you know, Bruce Dickinson balls to Picasso, you know, like that definitely wasn't metal, you know. And um, so I, I, my, a lot of people call, say, grunge caused it and grunge made all these bands, I guess, kind of start to freak out and they weren't as popular anymore and they weren't getting radio and MTV airplay. But I personally think, my opinion is, uh, it's the bands that did it themselves because if they had just, in my view, if they stayed true to their metal roots and they kept cranking out albums that got them popular to where they were, uh, I think a lot of them probably would have sustained and survived that period of time frame way more than... Uh, a lot of them had so like a, again like a great white or a Queensryche or even a Dokken that comes out with shadow life or whatever that crazy one was like it's almost proggy blues jazz I'm not sure what it is I think that's where they started losing. I don't think it was the popularity and I know there was a whole trend going on but um I think like Megadeth they just kept doing the same thing overkill kept doing the same thing Metallica in some ways even though St. Anger is a whole different story but Kind of kept doing the same thing. So I think it was the bands. They just, they, they overreacted, I think, to what was going on in the marketplace. So I think that's the biggest issue. Just coming as a Metalhead fan, knowing that I would pop some of these albums on back in the day and be like, what the hell is this? Vertomatic? 
Well, uh, uh, retracting, going backwards, uh, Metallica, they um, toured the world for three years for the Black Album. 90 to 93, played over like 300 concerts, and they were fried. And actually, if you remember, Mark, when they came out for the load and reload, they did a uh, re-imaging. They cut all their hair. The music was different. I don't know if it was with the times, but there was the Metallica thing. I have an inkling going through it that the part of the problem with the 90s decline of the metal was the excess of the late 80s with the hair metal, where it was literally uh, cookie cutter bands, B list at best, and it was just an, an excess. And a lot of those bands, quote, grunge, they were, they were metalheads. They, um, you know, like the Soundgardens and. Uh, Pearl Jams and a lot of those bands, Alice in Chains, they're all big metal heads, but they were just younger and it was their, their, their style of music was just coming along. So the combination of bad bands, the turn of the turn of the decade and things were changing. And it seems like it was like overnight when that first Nirvana uh, video hit and it was just a staple of uh, things to come. But uh, the, the landscape was changing. Remember when uh, Faith No More came out and a lot of those bands, you know, they were metal, but they were a different kind. It was, the, you know, almost um, more thinking man's metal. No, I mean, I, I agree. Like, if you look back at people that talk about metal and the hair metal and glam and what was going on in L.A. and all that craziness, you know, you know, our labels were signing bands left to right. It was quality over quantity. One hit wonders, all the deal, the whole hairspray look got out of control, and a lot of bands fell for that. Like even my favorite band, Judas Priest, fell for it with Turbo, and I'll never forget going to that Turbo tour. And I remember got the I got that stupid tour guide thingy, and I flipped it on the back. This is before they hit the stage, so you know this is before YouTube and social media, so you didn't know what you were going to see. And I look in the back, and I see that the photo with the band with the frilly hair, and even Rob Helford had long hair, and I'm like. The crazy looking outfits. I'm like, and then you know, Turbo in and of itself had synthesized guitars. I'm like, where where are these guys going, man? Like, you know, um, and I remember just being like almost like disappointed. Now looking back, I I have a high regard for Turbo now and that little era, and I know it got him really famous in some ways. But I think that's just to me was more the bands and then, yeah, quick even like Cinderella. Like the first album was great, Night Songs, and Long Cold Winter came out. I'm like, okay, a little bluesy, but it's still really good. I would call it metal. Boom, Heartbreak Station drops. And I'm like, that's not even rock. Like, you know, I don't know what that even is. So I go back to these bands just, and I don't think they know what to do, to be honest, at that point. They were just experimenting and trying to take it wherever they could. Well, but then what about bands like Queensryche? They had the progressive, you know, uh, the EP and then Empire or um, The Warning. And they were more glammed out on Rage for Order. And then they came out with Operation Mindcrime, which was, you know, we've chronicled the significance of that. But then um, that was 87, 88, 89. But then in the early 90s, they came out with Empire. And yeah. But then right after that, Promised Land, you know, that again, yeah, great, great example. Band I loved, Get Me Through Rage of Order, Get Me Through Operation Empire. Promised Land hits, I'm kind of like, I'm hanging in with you. Here in the now frontier, I'm like, oh, I don't know where you guys are going. Q2K comes out and then Tribe, and I'm you lost me. Well, I'm sorry, they lost like, Chris DeGarmo. Chris, uh, Chris DeGarmo. Did they? Yeah, I think he did Promise Land, but then he was gone. Well, then they lost Jeff Tate, and then well, the, yeah, but Chris DeGarmo was wrote that. That was that was Chris. The, Chris DeGarmo was the guitarist that wrote all that shit. So once you leave, once you lose him. Good point. You know, um, so that, that's what happens with these bands. And going back to Priest, you know, I don't want to say they peaked, but, you know, they, they, had their pro, they had their progression from the 70s, British Steel, Point of Entry, Screaming for Vengeance, and then Defenders of the Faith. So, so even when Defenders of the Faith was coming, they were going down. And then, then Turbo. Yeah. But I just, as a Metalhead fan, I just remember back in the day, uh, you know, getting excited when these new albums were going to come out, uh, you know, ready to hear some metal, popping these CDs in. 
uh, and then just being like disappointed, like what the hell? Like this is not the metal that I. This is not why I got into these bands. By the way, back to Queensrÿche. Um, you're right. Degarmo left right in eighty ninety. Well, he was there all the way through ninety eight. So he was there kind of in the nineties. Then he drops. And then I guess he popped in at two oh three in two thousand seven. So he's been in and out. But uh, my point is, I just I remember as a metalhead. Highly disappointed in these bands to the point I kept trying to hang in with them. Then I got disappointed. Even like with with Priest, at least like when Painkiller came and I was like, okay, here we go again. Back back to the metal, you know. Um, and I even thought that way about And Justice for All. Like when I first first played that, I was kind of like, I don't even know where Metallica was going. Yeah, you know, drums were really heavy, longer songs. I mean, now I would say that's definitely in their top four or five releases of all time. But anyway, I just I go back to I think the bands. If they had just stayed to their roots, stayed to what brought all the, because I think they wouldn't have lost as many fans versus worrying about trying to gain new ones. But um, yeah, and then you know that that's when bands start breaking up and they start you know, and that that also hurts you know when bands are no longer together anymore. So uh, there's no doubt that metal took a huge hit in the '90s. Uh, I guess the good news is it rebounded somewhere in the 2000s, and um, It'll never be the same that it was, clearly, um, as the, you know, they were the kings of the mountain for a while. And, uh, and you know. uh, commenting on the Judas Priest. So uh, what was it? Painkiller. And then what was that order? It was uh, R- painkiller came after the. Well, don't forget you had. Well, painkiller was the last one with Rob. And then then you had then Rob leaves. And then you had the Ripper era, right? Okay. So yeah. that's that's how that kind of went down. Um, and uh, Painkiller followed up um, Ram It Down. Okay, Ram It Down. Yeah, thank yeah, you. And Ram It Down was a, was, a, was a little bit of a comeback, I thought, after um, they departed all the way from Turbo. So, um, you know, that, they started coming back. But then, you know, when, when Painkiller came out, they, they went all the way back, right? Um, so, yeah, it's – and then, by the way, then – but but – but Rob Helford went into the uh, fight mode, which was definitely <laughs> heavy. But then he even dropped out and went to that two band that he came out with, which was way off the charts, like Trent Reznor craziness oh. stuff. Well, you know, so I, Rob, Rob was going through his uh, period. So, but <laughs> you know what? It's 2020 and we're still talking about our band. So now we have a couple uh, debatable subjects tonight on Metal Mayhem ROC. Again, you could reach us at our website, MetalMayhemROC.com, or come along and join us on the Facebook page. Either way, just search Metal Mayhem ROC, and you can find us on all your social channels. Until next week, for Metal Forever Mark, I'm the Vernomatic. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Metal for Life. Thanks for listening to Metal Mayhem ROC. Check out our websites at MetalMayhemROC.com and MetalForever.com for information on upcoming concerts, podcasts, archives, and all sorts of info. Please like, follow, and share with everyone, even your non-metal friends. Catch us next time on WLFE-DB Radio.